been going on for many months. Uh, and uh, the end of the series. Or closer to the end of the series, we have only a few uh, more to discuss so that we know how to recognize them. And the spirit that we are going to tonight is uh, the spirit of witchcraft. The spirit of witchcraft. Now, the uh, Old Testament Hebrew for the word uh, witchcraft is custom. okay, and the New Testament for witchcraft is pharmakia. Kasem in the Hebrew uh, actually uh, is almost, if not identical to And uh, comes from the Hebrew root word pasam, uh, which means uh, to divine. Now, uh, you know, in the past we covered the spirit of divination. divination is prognosticating or telling the future. Okay, the scripture. Divination is an abomination to the Lord. Reading horoscopes, the astrology, palmistry, numerology, uh, runes, uh, 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 card reading, tarot card reading, uh, any. Reading entrails, reading tea leaves, reading palms, palmistry, any of those forms of divination are an abomination to God. Okay? Now, it is true that uh, the meaning of kasem in the Hebrew uh, aligns witchcraft with divination. And is a specific form of witchcraft. It's minister only one thing. They're called by the thing they minister, right? Okay? Uh, we know that the, the scripture names them, right? The scripture talks about the spirit of fear. That ministers only fear. See? The, the scripture talks uh, about the uh, uh, Jealousy, that ministers jealousy, okay? Divination is witchcraft, but the spirit of divination specifically ministers the practice of divination and the responses and results of divination, okay? Now, uh, notice that the word changes in the New Testament. The New Testament word for witchcraft uh, is pharmakia, from which we get the English word pharmacy or drugs. Okay, in uh, Revelations eighteen twenty three, it says, "Your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by their witch pharmakia or pharmacy were the nations deceived." Okay. Now, the merchants that are being talked about there, this is an end-time prophecy. That's the first thing you need to understand from the viewpoint of eschatology uh, or, or the stuff. This is an end-time prophecy. So the merchants there are the great men of the earth. This is talking about drug pushers. Okay? Uh, who are merchandising witchcraft, 
drugs that harm or hurt or alter the consciousness. So, their witchcraft, pharmacia, were the nations deceived. See, the scripture says. Now, uh, pharmacia, New Testament Greek, not only means witchcraft, but now the expands, it means uh, in the divination. Now the definition expands in the New Testament and it includes sorcery. Okay? It includes magic. So that by the time we see what the Holy Spirit is doing, it's unfolding a whole picture of what witchcraft really entails. It's a much bigger scope. Uh, and you would only understand that if you were able to do a word study in the Hebrew or of the Old Testament or the Greek of the New Testament in order to uh, understand what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing here. Remember, the vocabulary of the Old Testament is quite different than the vocabulary of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, a demon was called a familiar spirit because it was familiar with you, your family line, your grandfather, your great-grandparents, your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents because it was assigned by Satan to that family line and went down in that family line all the way. So a familiar spirit in the Old Testament was called... Uh, a demon was called a familiar spirit. The word idol, ideal, in the Old Testament actually means demon. That's what the word means. Say, idolatry. Okay? And uh, in the New Testament, the word demon is used for the first time as a, as a disembodied soul or spirit of an unsafe person in the kingdom of Satan, in the kingdom of darkness. Okay? Now, the point is that with this broad definition of witchcraft, including divination, including uh, magic, uh, including sorcery, okay, including uh, witchcraft, the, the picture that we get is that these things are basically interchangeable in understanding. When the Spirit uh, uh, says or uses a word such as sorcery in the Old or New Testament, he's talking about witchcraft or magic. When he uses the word magical arts or magic in the New Testament, he's talking about witchcraft or sorcery. Okay? The practitioners in the Old in the New Testament of uh, these arts, these black arts, if you want to call them that, these occult sciences, if you were, uh, the word science means knowledge, okay, in the Greek, occult knowledge practitioners, if you want to call them that, uh, summon up demons that carry out uh, the incan incantations, the rituals of sorcery, or anything else, okay? And one of the things that you have to understand is that the reason that witchcraft operates by rituals or ceremonies, okay, is because of the fact that just about any kind of a ritual will summon a demon. Demons operate by rituals, okay? You even made up rituals will summon a demon. Okay? Even made up rituals. That's what makes uh, religious rituals so very, very dangerous. Say, because rituals have no place in the Christian faith walk. There is no place in the Old Testament. Or the New Testament, where we are mandated by the Holy Spirit to do a ritual of any kind. You see? And there was a reason for that. The Holy Spirit kept peoples from, uh, from that because rituals 
Bibles throughout history have always been associated with witchcraft. See? So when they're brought into uh, religious acts or ceremonies, they become a form of what's called a religious witchcraft, but it's still witchcraft. See? And it does summon the spirits. And um, uh, uh, those who practice these things, these arts, if they are a, uh, a woman practitioner, they are called a witch. A male witch is called a warlock. And uh, if it's a tribal witch doctor, uh, communicating with nature spirits out in the jungle somewhere, elementals, okay? Uh, they are referred to as shamans. And shamans can be male or they can be female, okay? Is medicine or, or, or witch doctors, okay? A shaman. They're all witches, basically. Uh, no matter how you look at it, that's, that's what they are. They may be called uh, by names um, uh, according to culture, variations of cultures. For instance, uh, a uh, Hawaiian witch doctor would be called a kahuna, okay? A uh, Tibetan witch doctor would be called a shaman, okay? Uh, and a Hindu witch doctor would be called a shaman, okay? So, uh, you will you will know these things uh, according to the culture. The point is, regardless of what label you put on them, what they are practicing is one and the same thing. It's witchcraft. Okay? Why do they practice witchcraft? And, and, and what is the significance of why the spirit of witchcraft is rampant throughout the world today? of darkness operates out of witchcraft. That's how it operates. Okay? And the other thing that you need to know is that witchcraft as a form of sorcery always goes hand in hand with vampirism. Okay? They go hand in hand. They're not apart from each other. They are apart of each other. Wherever uh, you see a spirit of witchcraft, wherever you see a witch or a warlock hanging around or doing things, you can bet your bottom dollar there are going to be vampire spirits hanging around. Okay? Almost always. It's very, very common. Okay? Now, uh, what is it? that uh, permits a witch or a warlock or a shaman uh, to pursue this kind of activity. Why do they do it? The answer to that is power. They have discovered that there is a power behind it. See, the demons empower them to do things. Perform for them. And they can ask by ritual for a favor or to, do, to get this favor or that favor from a spirit. And the spirit will do those things and, and pour out Satan's blessing uh, upon them. Okay? It will always extract from them a payment. Always extract from them penalty. See? I had a um, an evangelist from uh, Africa uh, several years ago write me a letter. And some of you, I told this story, I won't repeat it, but I'll just tell you that this was a, a woman who was taken at the age of 21 into the ocean by and uh, kept at the bottom of the Indian Ocean for 11 years. She was ruled by a, a spirit called the Queen of the Coast. 
uh, and uh, in evil and given empowerments and then returned to her community. And she said there were whole civilizations of spirits under the water. She said there was a university there. They spoke in English, and they taught nothing but evil and destruction and stuff like that. And she says, I'm not lying to you. I saw it with my own eyes. And you know, it's an interesting thing, because in the scripture, it says of Jesus, all above the earth, earth will bow to his name. Okay? And let's face it, what is under the, earth, under the sea is below the earth, isn't it? Say? Okay? And in Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, it talks about the water spirits. It speaks about them. Say? We know that these things are true as a matter of divine revelation. Anyway, to make a long story short, he was and was given power. And in return for that power, she, as a uh, tribal shaman, she had to harvest for those spirits 2,000 souls a month. She had to do it. And she had to kill them so that they would die in their sin. And, and say, those souls. And she was given a 2000 a month. She had to do that. See? And how would she kill people? With spells and conjurations and acts of witchcraft. She didn't even have to see them. Okay? She could cause them to drop dead. See? People from different tribes. And she would have to kill up to 2,000 people a month. And one day... Uh, an evangelist came into their village and, and she decided she was going to kill this evangelist. And uh, so she tried and uh, nothing happened. See, he's not in the kingdom of darkness, he's in the kingdom of light. <laughs> See, and her power didn't work. And so the Holy Spirit gave him a witness that she was trying to harm him. This evangelist went to her and, and said to her, uh, you can't hurt me. I serve a greater power, he said to her. And uh, he said, uh, and you can know this power. And uh, I think, if I recall right, he demonstrated the power to her by binding her power. Couldn't do anything, if I recall correctly. And uh, she saw the power of God, and she gave her heart to Christ, and she renounced everything. And she was afraid to do it because she thought that these water spirits were going to come and kill her. Say, but the evangelist assured her she was transferred into the kingdom of light, and they had no power against her. And he bound them up and off. She became an evangelist, and today has in Africa, bringing people to Christ. See? Why did they do what they did for the power? See? Well, the first thing you need to know about witchcraft, whether it's new age, regardless of what it is, it's about power. That's what they want, is the power. And the spirits are uh, very ready, willing, and able to give them the And that's why after 5,000 years, witchcraft is still around today. Witchcraft began with Nimrod, didn't it? King Nimrod of Babylon. Okay? And it is still around today. Why is it still around today? You know and I know that uh, if something doesn't work, we lose interest in it, don't we? And we go on to something else. Huh? We try this medicine, oh, this doesn't work. Well, you know, we, we throw it away and we go to something else. Right? If this technique of building something doesn't work, we try another technique. Okay, but if we don't get a satisfaction out of something, 
it's a human uh, it's human nature that what we do is we move to something else, don't we? Hmm? Okay. How come people dabble in witchcraft and they don't get it up and they don't lose interest in it? You ever wonder about that? The reason is because it works. See. It has power behind it. But the power is from the kingdom of darkness, not from the kingdom of light. Now, uh, the British and Scottish witchcraft has perpetrated a belief worldwide that there is such a thing as white magic and black magic. Okay? And that white magic is for people's good. Okay? And is used for good, and white witches are good witches. There is no such thing as a good witch in God's eyes. Okay? There's no such thing as a good witch in our eyes. And there is no such thing as white magic. All magic is magic. All magic and sorcery of witchcraft is black. Okay? Everything is deception. And everything in the uh, realm of the practice of witchcraft is a lying deception. Okay? These people are deceived, and because they see the power, they think they're doing something right. But there is no salvation in what they do. Okay? Now, we want to, uh, to look at the origin of witchcraft, and if you will, turn with me to uh, Genesis um, chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We're going to begin with that background um, to look at this a little closer. And this is the story of Nimrod, who was the great grandson of Noah. Okay. A mighty hunter on the earth, the scripture says. But in the Hebrew and in the historical context of which the Jewish historian Josephus wrote down the oral tradition of the Hebrews, it is apparent that when it says he was a mighty hunter upon the earth, that he was a hunter of men and of men's souls. Okay? In other words, he is the first written account in the scripture of... Uh, a witch or a warlock. Nimrod, King Nimrod of Babylon was uh, the father of witchcraft. His wife, Queen Semiramis, uh, was the um, uh, sorceress queen of Babylon. Okay, and much of what is considered uh, witchcraft and torture came down through her. Uh, for instance, the cross itself, okay, was an invention of Queen Semiramis uh, that was used for crucifixion. It's Babylonian in origin. It was adopted by the Romans. It was foreign to Israel and to the Hebrews and was brought into Israel and uh, uh, into the Hebrew culture by the Romans during their occupation. Uh, of Israel, but it originated in Babylon. Okay? So when it says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter on the earth, in the Hebrew, both historically and in the and through the understanding of the, of the Hebrew semantics, it meant that he was a hunter of men or men's souls. And what that implication is was that he was a warlock, he was a witch. Okay, and it's important that you understand the uh, uh, the story from the viewpoint uh, of what God's position uh, regarding witchcraft was uh, in the Old Testament, and uh, it'll show you why God hated this. Uh, let me just get a, re a reference here. Uh, 1 Samuel 15.23. Keep your, keep your uh, page there in Genesis 11.1. 1. 
go to 1 Samuel 23 for a moment. And look at verse 15. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on. Uh, I, did I say 1 Samuel 23? I'm sorry, I got it wrong. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Okay? Now here, uh, Samuel uh, um, was uh, talking to uh, Saul. Now, Notice what it says here. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the sin of idolatry. Okay? One of the things that God says about witchcraft is that it is a form of rebellion against him. You see, uh, go back now to Genesis 11. I wanted to make that point because you must understand that Nimrod uh, was rebellious. He was the father of witchcraft because, not just because he practiced witchcraft, hunted for the souls of men, which witches do even today, but because of the fact that uh, he was rebellious against God. Remember, he built the Tower of Babel, right? Why did he build the Tower of Babel? He was angry with God. And what he was angry with God over was the flood that occurred at the time of his great-grandfather Noah. Okay? That those people from the earth had been destroyed by God. And he decided he was going to build a tower up to heaven. Okay, so that God could never drown him or his descendants again, okay, like he did at the time of Noah, and also so that he could war with God. Now that's rebellion in the heart, hmm? Okay, now the, you say, well, but how do you know some of this? Because that's not in the Word of God, is it? No. This is oral tradition handed down by the Hebrews through the scribes. Remember, scribing accurately the history of the Jews, the history of the Hebrews, also, uh, uh, I should say, uh, was something that was carried on, okay, from uh, uh, early antiquity, about 3,500 years before Christ, all the way up to 800 years after Christ. Scribing didn't stop uh, in the Middle East, even among the Arabs. Uh, until uh, around uh, 800 A.D., see, about 100 years after uh, Muhammad established Islam. Uh, so uh, what we see here is a picture of a man who was a warlock, okay? Now watch what happens. Turn to chapter 11 and read along with me. From verse 1 to 9. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. 
Now, do you have a problem with that? God does. Okay? He says, let us build a tower and let us go up to heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. See? Didn't care about God. He was going to make a name for himself. Okay? And he says, lest we be scattered over all of the earth. Well, if you read Genesis 1, God said for them to be scattered over all of the earth. He said, go and multiply and replenish all of the earth and take possession of all that there lies therein. That was God's will, that they go and multiply and be spread over all of the earth. Huh? See? And so what, what Nimrod was saying was the exact opposite. No, we're not going to do that. We're staying here, and we're going up there. See? Didn't care whether he needed permission from God or anything like that. Just decided that he was going to exalt his will over the will of God. That's rebellion. See? And that's why 1 Samuel 15.23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the sin of idolatry. Okay? Now, witchcraft is a form of idolatry. Okay? Because it's spirits who carry the works of witches and warlocks out. Okay? And in order to do that, the witches and the warlocks must do ceremonies, rituals, incantations, conjurations, uh, castings of spells, uh, bewitchments, enchantments, charmings, etc., to worship those spirits. Okay? And demon worship is a form of idolatry. You see? Okay? So witchcraft goes hand in hand with idolatry. Okay? Now read on and watch what happens. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Why? Because they have an intellect and they uh, were made on the earth in the image and likeness of God. Huh? Okay? Except they're using it for the wrong thing. All right? So now uh, notice what God says. Verse 7. Come, let us. Who's us? Yeah. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. See, God got his way. Huh? That's what God wanted them to do, and he got his way. Okay? So he scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay? Now, here is the point that you needed to know. The hallmark, the hallmark evidence of the presence of witchcraft, whether it's in a person's individual life or whether it's in the life of a society like the Iraqis, etc., okay, is confusion. We see here from the scripture that the fruit of witchcraft is confusion. Okay, that is God's response, God's judgment on witchcraft. Okay, he confused them. He permitted confusion to come upon them. Okay, and whenever you see witchcraft operating in a person's life, okay, you will see 
that there's an element of confusion there in their personal lives as well. Okay? Confusion is one of the first clues to the presence of witchcraft. One of the first clues to the presence of the spirit of witchcraft. Okay? And wherever there is confusion, there is witchcraft. Now, I'm not talking about someone who's working at a desk temporarily getting disoriented because he was sidetracked by a phone call and then forgetting where he was at in his work and then he goes, oh, now I remember, and he goes back to it, okay? What I'm talking about is a pattern of confusion in their everyday life, in the way they live, in the things they do. They can't see the wrong they do, okay? Remember that witchcraft says good is evil and evil is good. It is the kingdom of darkness which operates just opposite to the kingdom of light, right? Okay? So the position of the practitioner of witchcraft is that everything he is doing is good. See? It is for the benefit of of people are to get this, make this person fall in love with this guy using this potion or incantation or spell or enchantment or bewitchment, okay? Or something like this. That's not good. That's evil. You're interfering with someone's free will. And when you pray prayers, okay, to change someone into your image and likeness of what you want them to be, you're a practitioner of witchcraft. When you are praying over someone or for their circumstances, okay, to change their hearts, okay, to fall in love with this person or to hate that person, you're practicing witchcraft. When you're interfering with the free will of another person or you're praying to change their destiny, okay, in some way that may be contrary to their free will, especially if you don't know their free will, okay, you're practicing witchcraft. See? What you have to be praying is for God's perfect will for their life. God's perfect mate for them. See? Okay? Things like that, that God's plan for their life will be carried out and predominate. But when you start... Uh, praying and you're directing those prayers at the person rather than to the Lord, okay, you're using soul power, not praying in the Spirit. It's not prayer in the Spirit. That's soul power. And you're directing those prayers at the person, okay, and guess what's going, what it's going to do? It's going to harm that person. Soul power prayer always harms people. See? I can't tell you how many times people have come to me in the past and they've said, oh, I had this awful cold. And so-and-so uh, told me that they were praying for me and I just wish they would stop because I'm getting worse. See? What's the and it's happened ever since they told me they were starting to pray for me. What happened? They're praying soulish prayers. See? They're praying their will for the person and they're directing the prayer from themselves to the person rather than directing their prayer to God. See, that's soul power. Okay? And by the way, we have an audio tape on that in, uh, in the bookstore about the dangers of soul power. Soul power is how witchcraft operates. All witchcraft operates on the soul level, not the level of the spirit. Jesus says the things of the spirit are spirit. Okay? We have a spirit man, a soul man, and a physical man. Okay? And uh, the soul... Man is the mind, the will, and the emotions, the Bible tells us. The spirit man is the conscience and the intuition, your huncher. Okay? All right? And so the things of the spirit are spirit. Soul power, or witchcraft, operates on the soul level. It's a thing of the soul. Okay? And they direct that power, and it comes from the power of the soul of the person, and the soul energy of the person to the other person, okay? And when they recruit the demons, the demons will uh, 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 amplify 
the effects by ministering directly to the person. You see? Sometimes people, after they've been prayed uh, for under soul power, get confused. They say, gee, I don't feel, that person laid hands on me. I don't feel right since they laid hands on me. See? How many of you have ever had an experience like that or know of an experience like that? Two, three, four people here. Yeah. See? That's, uh, and, and so uh, that's how you, how you know whether this is witchcraft or not. Now, some people can innocently pray from the soul level and not realize they're doing it, but some people may do it maliciously and purposely because they're witches or warlocks. See? Okay? And they are trying to produce an effect on that person. They are trying, they are trying uh, to purposely uh, uh, control or, or defeat that person's life. You know, about 16 years ago, uh, I was invited to give a talk before the, um, uh, what is that businessman's fellowship uh, association called? Uh, the um, No, no, it's not the Christian Chamber of Commerce. It's, uh, you know, Shikarian's organization. You know the, you know the organization? I, 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 was, uh, I was asked to give a talk to the local chapter uh, in Perrine. And uh, a prophet came to me that afternoon. And I mentioned it to him that I was going to give this talk uh, uh, to uh, the Businessmen's Fellowship that evening. And he said to me, he said, be careful. He said, there's going to be a witch there. And she's going to come up and lay hands on you, he said to me. Uh, he says, the Holy Spirit has shown me that she's going to come up and she's going to lay hands on you. And uh, he says, uh, she's going to try to do a working against you. Be very careful. And I said, okay. I forgot about it. Uh, that evening came. I gave the talk. And uh, at the end of the talk, uh, when people were beginning to leave, this lady comes up the aisle, okay? I'd say probably in her late 30s. Uh, and very sweet, uh, very sweet uh, uh, in her manner and in her speech. And she says, uh, oh, I just feel led by the Holy Spirit to lay hands on you and pray on you, if you'll let me. And the Holy Spirit said to me, the witch. See? And before I could say no or anything like that, she did. And she laid hands on me, and she started praying in tongues, and they were demonic tongues. Okay? And I immediately started praying in tongues, okay? And I just stood there, uh, and I had been covered with the blood of Jesus, so nothing was happening to me. And I just stood there, and I, pl I prayed in tongues, and I just outprayed her. And I just kept praying in tongues uh, until she stopped. And when she stopped, I continued praying in tongues, okay, for another uh, minute or so. And she stood back very perplexed, you know, and she knew she didn't get the effect that she had hoped to get, okay? And she looked at me, she says, well, I guess that's all, good night. See? And, and she just walked out. I called my friend, okay, and, 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 uh, the prophet, and I said, you were absolutely right. I said, she was there, and she came up, and she laid hands, <laughs> just like you had prophesied. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but you see, the power of witchcraft didn't have any effect on me, okay? Neither was I afraid of it, because, you know, I know they can't hurt if you're in the kingdom of God and you're covered with the blood of Jesus, okay? Right? Okay, so it's the rebellion and it's the power 
uh, can I have five more minutes or so? Yeah, it's, it's rebellion and it's the power that they are after. Okay? Uh, it's control. Witchcraft is about power and control. Witchcraft today comes in many forms, including New Age uh, types of forms. Okay? Uh, notice that many of the times they will engage in things which will be directed toward advancing the entrance of a demon or you're contacting the demons on assignments within you. For instance, uh, yogic meditation to try to contact the self with a capital S that's inside of you. Okay, the self with a capital S that's inside of you is the ruler spirit, the demonic spirit. They call them the spirit guide. Okay, spirit guides are demons. Okay, and uh, they they will uh, they'll try to deceive you in yoga and meditation into diving deep, diving deep to make these contacts. Okay, uh, you won't make those contacts. Uh, you'll make contacts with spirits. A very uh, a great example is uh, 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 a relative uh, of Nora's uh, was in Ekinkar. And uh, uh, Ekankar is a New Age religion type thing that comes from Hinduism and Buddhism. And he was told by uh, his instructors that he had to contact the Ekmasters who were inside of him. And that if he would delve deep, he would, he would make contact with these Ekmasters. Okay? And uh, that Jesus was a lower level spirit in this pantheon of masters and that he was to contact the greater spirits and so he began practicing the second car thing and he was seeking to contact these other greater uh, spirits and one day Jesus showed up instead of them and he couldn't figure out if he's a lower spirit how come he showed up and why didn't the others show up Okay, and the Lord spoke to him. Okay, and gave him a revelation of who he is. And today he's born again Christian. See, because of that. See, but you notice what the witchcraft did. It turned things around and said, "No, Jesus is low. We're high." See, white is black. See, black is white. Good is evil. Evil is good. Okay, Isaiah says, woe to them who call evil good and good evil. Woe to them. See? Okay, well let's uh, stop there for tonight. And uh, we'll continue this uh, study next week. And we're going to look as we go into the uh, operation of the spirit of witchcraft next week. We're going to start looking at the, looked at the background understanding so that you can recognize what is witchcraft and what is not witchcraft uh, in, uh, in today's session. In the next session, we're going to look at the examples of witchcraft in the scriptures. We're going to look at uh, Saul's uh, encounter with the witch of Endor. We're going to uh, uh, look at God's position on how to try a witch and what to do, you know, uh, God's position include uh, uh, in regard to these people are okay, and we're going to look at the New Testament um, uh, scriptures that define witchcraft from the uh, New Testament believers' uh, viewpoint and how he should recognize, understand, and understand and what the remedy is. Okay. So Lord, we give you thanks, praise, and glory for this evening. We bless your name, uh, and uh, we ask that you get the revelations of the word uh, into your, uh, into the hearts and minds of all of your servants, uh, that they would be use it, that they would use it to minister to others, uh, Lord, and that it would bless and free. All in Jesus' name do we pray. The saints said in agreement. Amen. Anybody have any questions? Yeah.
praying for someone in your life. Yeah. You want to bring a family member or someone close to Christ. It's not a believer. Um, what is the proper way to do that? So that it, you know, that statement that you make when you pray for someone else. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, if you have someone you have a burden for that you want to bring to Christ, uh, what's the best way to approach them if they're not a believer? Okay. The first thing that you have to uh, uh, get them to do is to think about their mortality. Okay? Okay. Uh, And you need to plant a seed. It's a mistake to think that you may be able to do it all in one session. Okay? You may not. But what I like to do with them is, I, as we do with our evangelism course here, we ask them, uh, are you interested in spiritual things? And that usually opens up a discussion. Say, are you interested in the spiritual things? Uh, and that will usually open up a discussion. By the way, how many people here know how to present the gospel? Did you know that it's your duty to present the gospel? Every person needs to know how to present the gospel. See? And if you don't know how to present the gospel, uh, firstly, you've got to know the gospel to present it, right? Which means, yeah. <laughs> You've got you to gotta have a way of understanding it and a way of presenting it. If you don't know how to present the gospel, you will see me at the end. We're going to be uh, starting up the evangelism ministry again, where we'll train you in a very brief presentation on how to bring people to Christ. Yeah. Suppose it's not within your heart or your calling to do such a thing. There's no such thing as not, uh, not within your car. It's everybody's duty, the Bible says. Everybody. Preach the gospel, the scripture says. Preach the gospel. It applies to all believers. See? Yeah. It may not be your calling or your anointing to be an evangelist. Okay? But it's everybody's duty to preach the gospel. Yeah. Uh, In other words, if someone starts to talk to you about Jesus, that you would be able to tell them and what they have to do to uh, accept Jesus. So you believe, in, you believe, in, so you have to have faith where that where in that point for you to preach the gospel, you have to believe in Jesus to say needed Christ at the time to come to you for you to yeah you still? most of the time they're divine appointments he just puts them in your bed. Yeah. So how would you know right in the moment to uh, this is okay this is time to act, time to conduct, time to you'll just know the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit will just quicken you'll just he'll motivate you. He motivates you. It's not done under your own power. That's right. So is it is it wrong to something because I don't know for myself I could overdo and so and I, so but um, but I like talking about the word sometimes. It's, certain things come to me just like that. I, mean, I don't know how it happened. You know that's not just that's quickening by the Holy Spirit. And he does the same thing. But I could overdo it. Is that yeah. wrong to overdo it? Huh? <laughs> is it wrong to overdo it? Talk to somebody about the, the gospel. I mean, in your own. Well, you have to let, what you have to do is yield to the Holy Spirit in your Okay, okay. and he'll control you. Oh, okay, and just go to town. Go to town. Right. Yeah. But to get back to to get back to your answer, the first thing I would do is uh, uh, I would ask, them, "Are you interested in spiritual things?" So that will open the door for you. Okay, and. Uh, if they give you a maybe or a while, I don't know, or something like this, uh, you have an option of saying, uh, uh, 
well, uh, would you mind if I share something with you? Uh, or allow me to share something with you, if you will. Okay? Uh, and if they give you anything other than a flat no, uh, go ahead and start talking. If they say no, I'm not interested, or something like that, and close the door on you, then you know they're not ready. Huh? They're, they're just not ready. Okay? And so you just pray for the Holy Spirit to put someone else in their way in a situation like that. But if they do, I would like to, I always like to start out uh, asking a question to them. Tell me something. What is going to happen to you in the first five seconds after your death? So you get them to think about that. Okay? All right? I promise you that if you tell any person to who's not a believer to go in a closet or go to bed at night spend five straight minutes, just five continual minutes concentrating on what is going to happen to them in the first five seconds after their death. Ninety-nine percent of them become believers. <laughs> it's okay. the yeah, just about ninety-nine percent. Okay, because the realization is that they don't know. Okay. And they don't know if this is the only life there is or if there's such a thing as heaven or hell afterward. You see? And so then they, they might say to you something like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't believe that there's a heaven or hell afterwards. You know, and then If you don't know, are you willing to gamble with your eternal future? Because everybody has an eternal future. It's just a question of where you're going to spend it. Everybody. you're going to spend it. See? But lots of people have eternal life in hell. See? Lots of people have eternal life in heaven. You say, well, how do you know hell exists? Because Jesus said it. Mm -hmm. Well, how would Jesus know? Because he was the creator. He ought to know. was with God. In the Gospel of John, the Word is a title of Jesus. It says, He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through Him. He was the Creator. See, Father God was the designer, Jesus was the Creator, and the Holy Spirit is the sustainer. Okay. So Jesus created Him. And He spoke of Him. He spoke of Him. When I have discussions with some of these guys that are pretty much dying, old atheists sort of thing, you know, they, as far as they're concerned, when they die, it's just dust to dust, bones, and there's no such thing as, there's no such thing as eternal life. It's just, just nothing. You're just turning into a pile of bones and re applying or appealing to anything to the other source. Like, well, Jesus is there. So they don't believe there's anything as eternal, plus or minus. Yeah. So at that point in time, when you ask them, well, what's going to happen five minutes after you die? Nothing's going to happen five minutes after I'm done. That is it. That's the end. There's nothing else left. And it's a discussion. Mm -hmm. so yeah. where, you know, where do you, you know, well, you may not be able to bring them to where they need to be. You see? Uh, it, it all depends on whether they're willing to understand. Where you go from that point on is you have to bring 
them into an understanding that the Bible is a divine revelation. It's not an ordinary book. The Bible is a supernatural book. That's your position. Why is the Bible a supernatural book? One, uh, well, turn to this. Turn to Isaiah 53. Let me show you something. Isaiah 53. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah 53, look at uh, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a tender root, and like a root out of a parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should him, or appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Who is that talking about? That's Christ on the cross. Say, but why is this a supernatural book? Because this description of Christ, his ministry, and his crucifixion was written 850 years before Christ was born. Isaiah lived 850 years before Christ was born. That's not a When you can look 850 years in the future and describe Christ, his ministry, and his crucifixion, and his suffering, okay, this is a supernatural book. See? And that's what they have to understand. Another example, uh, if you will, uh, uh, another example uh, would be, I can't remember, where is it, uh, is it in Ezekiel, uh, or is it in Daniel, where the Lord said that he would uh, give his, he would make his servant Cyrus give the order to rebuild Jerusalem. Do you remember that uh, passage? Uh, in the Old Testament, well, the importance of that passage is that uh, uh, at the time the Lord said that, okay, Cyrus, who gave the order for the uh, Hebrews to return to Israel from captivity uh, in Syria, huh? Isaiah. It's Isaiah? Yeah. Uh, by the time, uh, at the time that that verse was written down, Cyrus wasn't born yet. Cyrus would not be born yet for another 250 years. Okay? And here, 250 years before, God says, I, I will command my servant Cyrus, calls him by name, king of Syria, to return my people to Israel, to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And, and, an amazing thing. See, that's another example because Isaiah 45, let's look at it. It's an interesting thing. Oh, it's just a few chapters back. Yeah, okay. Where are 45? Uh, 
uh, all scripture is is uh, spirit scribed. Wow, with a capital S. In other words, written by the Holy Spirit Himself. Okay. In other words, what what the real original manuscript is trying to convey is that the Holy Spirit wrote it through the apostles and the prophets. Therefore, the scripture was written down not by inspiration, but under divine possession. They were possessed by the Holy Spirit. So, yeah. Is that including like, the other thing when I was speaking about those laws? Yeah. You know, you know that was a spirit scribe. Includes all of it. All those laws in an exact, in exact way it's written? Because 90% of those laws were about if you break it, which is against God, you have to be put to death. Mm -hmm. Well, not put to death, but you would be, uh, yeah. you'd be severely chastised. Some of them you would be put to death. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, um, by the way, how do you know, uh, how do you know that the Holy Spirit was able to do that? That he was able to cause scripture to be written down by divine possession. Do you all know the story of the Septuagint? The Septuagint is a Bible that's still in existence today. Uh, it differs from our Bible in that uh, our Bible, Old Testament is Hebrew and New Testament is Greek. But in the Septuagint Bible. Uh, the Old Testament is Greek and the New Testament is Greek. Okay? And there was a reason for this. And that was because the Greeks who, uh, I'm sorry, the Jews who lived in Greece during that time didn't read or write Hebrew. They didn't speak Hebrew and they didn't know Hebrew. So there had to be a means to provide them with their Old Testament scriptures uh, culturally, you know, in a way that they could read and understand. See? So the story of the Septuagint is that 70 Hebrew scholars uh, got together and they prayed to the Lord for divine guidance in translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. Okay? And they went on the shores of the Mediterranean, uh, there in Israel, and they set up 70 tents. And every scholar went into one tent. Okay? And they began to write, and they began to scribe. Because remember, their practice was scribing. Huh? Okay? Under the anointing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is a true story, a true legend, uh, carried down by you know, oral tradition. You know, they're very accurate on how they carry down oral traditions from the time of Adam and Eve onward. That's part of striving. They're trained how to do that. And, and uh, so they went in their tents and they began writing, writing writing and writing until the Old Testament was totally completed. They didn't come out of their tents. They were brought food and everything like that. Okay? And the 70 had 70 manuscripts to send to Greece, to the Jews in Greece. And when they were done, and they came out of their tents, and they sat together, and they compared the manuscripts, the 70 manuscripts were word for word. Every one of the manuscripts were identical to every uh, every other manuscript, word for word. Isn't that incredible? Awesome. See? And that's the, that's the history of the, of the origin of the Septuagint Bible. Is it anywhere in uh, non uh, uh, secular histor history? Any secular historians put that down? I'm sure that you. Always find someone somewhere. Yeah. Because the typical question is to relate that to someone. Said, well, yeah, but that's just biblical hearsay. I mean, how do we know that that's any, any truth to it? Well, they typically ask for outside verification. Well, you know, they said that about Jericho. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
And, uh, you know, well, that's just a Bible story. You know, how do we know? We don't even know where Jericho is, okay? And a couple of years ago, they found it. They found the walls falling down, just like it's described in the Scripture. <laughs> you know, the archaeologists in the recent past found Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses received the Ten Commands, and they went up to the top. In fact, I saw the video. Yeah, did you see the video? And they, they went up. To, they went up to the top, and, and the rocks were uh, burned with carbon from the fire of the lightning that came down to write the Ten Commandments. They actually found the site. What is that? What we know is a, is a different place. It's Sinai in Arabia. Yeah. yeah. And they had to That's get it. in there. Because yeah. it was all bad, bad, wired off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, so as time goes on, what we're seeing is the accuracy of the Bible by pattern. You see, the, the archaeologists now are confirming just what the scripture said. You see? Just about four weeks ago, or six weeks ago, they found a coffin. Right? James, brother of Jesus, is mentioned in the scripture. They had no historical proof that Jesus ever had a brother named James. See? And they found his casket uh, about four or five weeks ago. It was all over the news. Yeah. You mean See? the one that wrote the book of James, right? Hmm? The one that wrote the book of James? There were two Jameses. Uh, there was James, the brother of Jesus. Well, actually, they referred to them as James the Lesser and James the Greater. Right. James the Lesser and James the Greater. I don't know whether the Lesser was a brother of Jesus or not. But one was a cousin of Jesus, wasn't he? Yeah, one was a cousin of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. But does that answer your question as to yeah, how to get actually, into it? Actually, my, my question wasn't so much how to do it. It was... When you're praying for someone, you know, that I would pray that my father would come to know Jesus, how, how is it best to pray that prayer, that God would remove the scales from his eyes? And, and Just like that. First thing that the scripture says is, no one can go to the Lord unless he be called by the Father. So the first thing you got to pray is for the Father to call. That's the first thing you have to do. Right? Jesus says, no man can come unto me unless he be called by the Father. So the first thing you have to pray is, Father, call him in Jesus' name. Request that so, Jesus call him. Huh? I have to pray that Jesus will call him. Request no, 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 that the Father will call him. Oh, that God the Father. Yes. Yes. Um, one thing that really disturbed me a little bit was when you when you talk about like how witchcraft would like to do to everything backwards. Some parts of people said one little aspect I, I caught it when you say like they like to make something white into black and black into white. Why do we have to signify evil and good as to colors? No, I, we don't. I mean, because, because the answer to that is we don't. I'm just using that as an illustration. No, because what would you say is totally correct back in the times of uh, the Dark Ages to now, that they had referred to colors like black to be something of significance of evil yeah. or bad. All colors are actually. And white but, but because you see, the kingdom of darkness usurps things, takes advantage of things. Satan takes advantage of things. All colors are from God. Exactly. He's, he's the creator of everything. Right. Okay. I think that refers yeah. to darkness and light. And people translate to black. Black and white. Yeah. In other words, it's a metaphor. Right. metaphor. It's something which stands in representation of something else. But it's illustrative. We have a lot of ignorant yeah. people percentage within the world. Yeah. Especially like uh, back in the days, like I said, from in the Renaissance period to now, it carries on this of thinking in that. Okay. Really, do you really uh, look at it literally that black 
is evil and and sure. and why do you think good. Why do you think? Why do you think uh, witches always wear black for them? They love to wear black. They identify with that. See. But guess what? That's not going to stop me. Or a black, uh, you know, or a black car. You, know, so you see? Because as far as I'm concerned, God is the owner of all cars. I always wondered about that. In the yeah. Catholic Church, some of the Catholic churches, like yeah. the Methodist Church, yeah. okay, yeah. they were. Jesus talks about wearing the white robe of righteousness. <laughs> white is Jesus' color. We wear black. Ask him to be and tell you. It's religious. Now, I see who left this Catholic priest because in Haiti, when I say when we used to go to church, we used to go see the Lord, as Jean Michel was saying the other day. But I left his, his world because Haiti people go to church. They're truly seeking God. Now he built churches just like the Santa are churches in Hallelujah that they have here. Now people can be just saying, Will we come to Pastor Ben and say, I would like to get married? Now you can go to the church and have it openly as before they used to do them the suburb. This is stuff you could not do in the city. You see, here's another point. You just but, said no. that it was, that it was recognized. No, now, it was always they, there. That they could practice it. I mean, that they don't have to. Fox News is media This is it was always official. Asian used to practice their voting free, and they never cared about what people say. But check this out. Let me tell you what's going on. You got two different types of uh, um, beliefs right here. You got Vadu and Voodoo. Voodoo is the one that's talking about of witchcraft. And this could be in anywhere. The only thing that practices Vadu is in Haiti. That's what we call, uh, in a way, saying white magic. But naturally, that white magic is the good magic, which is really. Darkness, darkness, darkness. That's what I'm saying. That Bible right there. You're saying that's what they believe. 
listen to what I'm saying. Because it is the Bible with uh, religion down. But it's also a believer of God, okay, in our way. Okay? And when I mean our way, I'm talking about in, from Haiti. The religion is the rebellion against the French that was occupying Haiti at the time. Thus, as a result, we have we were the second nation of this hemisphere that have our independence. Okay, how do we communicate within the Bible? Is the tom toms with the tom or the tom toms here using smoke screens? Was and, and and when they was with that kind of communication, because um, the cowboys here or the line of communication, the line of communication was sometimes the tumble and everything else, and that was um, like which that was going with. Frenchman at the time was a big monster, and then therefore we won our independence. That's that's the, history, the true history behind it. Uh -huh. And was it for that vital um um the vital uh religion, we would probably still be under under, under occupation with the French, just like the Jamaicans are on 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 our country. Uh, so Why so much of a long occupation? 1962. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but let's get back here. Uh, did, I, did I finish answering your question or not? Yeah, it's just... It's kind of complicated because... My dad, First you ask the Lord to bring them.
do is you need to talk to him about the Bible and make him understand that the Bible is not just a good book written by men. But that is, that is not God's position. God's position is that the Bible is a divine revelation. Timothy 3.16. Okay. All scriptures of God. Therefore, the word of God has to be true. That's God's position. Okay. And that's the Father's position. friend isn't lying? Is he dead? So his position, so his position is that John 14, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, I no man goes to the Father except through me. Say, pointing out to him that it is Jesus' desire to take you to your grave. It's not Jesus' desire to Now 
It is. to Jesus, to letting him say. Let God be sure that every man a liar. Uh, The other, the other part you need to use with people like that. If, if they're wrong, you need to tell them. Uh, the Bible is a divine revelation, and that's not what it says. Okay? And what you need to know is God has a standard, and he does not lower his standard because of our ignorance. So you better find out what his standard is. So if you want to be saved, you better find out what his standard is. 
lower because of our but the importance is like you prayed before and, and that looks like you can't vent Yes, them, very, very important yeah. point yeah. is always pray ahead of time for the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart and mind to receive. Yeah. Very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always pray for the Holy Spirit to prepare their heart and mind to receive. Very important. And that's what I do before I, I yeah. go to a meeting. But like yeah. Pastor Lee was saying, some of them. And say, say the level of the so that there's no difference. be going towards them. I am blind. shining in. And I bind up and off the enemy. In Jesus' name. No, it's not oh, okay. Those who want to stay, some don't have to go to work. Yes. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> those of you that want to stay, we're going to.